Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beyond Environmental, Value Creation and Commercial Real Estate Through Social and Governance. My name is Chris Lofman. I'm the Vice President of Sustainability at Conservice. You know, within real estate, the environmental aspect of ESG has historically received the most attention and fanfare. However, social and governance issues are becoming more prevalent, and companies are receiving increased scrutiny from investors, employees, stakeholders, as well as residents and tenants on how they handle these important issues. In today's webinar, we're going to explore how organizations can address the evolving expectations around social and governance issues in particular. You know, our communities play a central role in the surrounding neighborhoods that they're in, and they have the power to contribute to advancing the economic, environmental and social well-being of our fellow citizens. This will become increasingly important as regulatory bodies and institutional investors sharpen their focus on social issues. We're seeing this sharper focus in real time today. From the European Commission forming a working group to explore the creation of social taxonomy that will provide guidance on what it means to be socially sustainable, to GRES integrating health and well-being indicators in this assessment. So before we get started and welcome everyone, I wanna hit a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be distributed to everyone after the session. Secondly, the webinar should run for approximately 45 minutes, give or take. We're gonna to try to save five or 10 minutes at the end though for questions. If you do have a question at any point during the webinar, you can submit it on the go to webinar control panel in the question section. We'll attempt to answer as many questions as we can, but if we don't get to all of them, members of our team follow up after the webinar to provide answers. Now that we've got those covered, let's introduce today's speakers. Alex Buchanan, COO of Rent Dynamics. Asila Rosellas, Head of ESG and Sustainability Bridge Investment Group. Andrea Shelf, ESG Manager and Subject Matter Expert on ESG Reporting here at Conservice on our GOBI team. So with that, let's get started with the panel discussion. So, like I said earlier, environmental initiatives have really kind of long dominated the ESG agenda, not just for commercial real estate, but really for business as a whole. Firms that are prioritizing social issues are less common than you'd think, but that's starting to change. So I kind of like to kind of go around the room here real quick and maybe let's start with you, Alex. Uh, and get from each of you kind of what you're seeing and hearing about the emergence of social issues in commercial real estate, kind of what's happening, and what are you seeing in the multifamily space? You know, two, two things that I see as a cause for acceleration of the focus on social issues in multifamily is everything that's happened with the pandemic and the unfortunate loss of employment for so many people and the legislative acts that kind of took place from that from the CARES Act. And some of those eviction moratoriums, I think, really led to a greater focus from firms understanding how the legislative bodies kind of view their business practices. And I think the second to me is as more insti uh, to institutional investors like BlackRock get into the single family home space, um, that's kind of garnering some attention from all different sectors and a bunch of different stakeholders. So I think both of those together, are two of the biggest things that I've seen that are leading to this increased focus. And, um, and I'd also say increased opportunity. I mean, so many of us have so many tenants. And I think as we go through the course of this discussion today, we'll see that there's a lot of easy ways to, that we can help them at scale. That's great. Basila, what are you seeing over at Bridge? Hi, well, uh, we've been doing a lot and, and I don't say that lightly. We, uh, the, the pandemic certainly affected us. It, it's affected everybody in so many ways. However, if I just put that um, on the side for a moment and I think back to just our work pre-pandemic on the social side, we really were an owner and operator of multifamily and we've been doing it for decades. And one of the key things we've seen is when you, when you put aside what you have to do financially for the asset, all the capex work, et cetera. You think about the experience of that resident or that tenant uh, living at your asset. It really takes things into a different perspective. And for us, we felt that driving a lot of the, the social awareness and programs towards our residents really do translate into uh, benefiting that bottom line. 
So just to give you uh, one key example in our workforce and affordable housing strategy, which is uh, in our multifamily vertical, we formed something called uh, BCEI, which is the Bridge Community Enhancement Initiative. And this particular initiative drives direct dollars that come from us taking off of our management fee, a percentage of, uh, of that to fund these programs. So ultimately we're delivering programs that are either offered to our residents at no or little cost to them. So everything from financial literacy to uh, job placement to support. And now if I, if I reintroduce the pandemic situation, we also had as part of that uh, COVID relief funds. We ended up uh, between that and also private dollars from employees pockets from Bridge funding two COVID relief funds where we had multiple millions of dollars that were distributed back to our residents. And for most of them, it helped put food on their table uh, when they were in between employment. It also uh, helped with uh, various childcare situations and also as they had to care for a loved one. And in some cases, even help them pay their bills. And ultimately, again, pandemic or not, we also believe, and we can get into this late, later, but we also believe in tracking. That's also been obviously both a challenge and an opportunity. How do you track the social side? I think it's pretty easy to track the environmental side when you think of ESG. The social side gets far more challenging, but also far more interesting. Yeah, no, you're right. And part of that too, I think a really great point that you bring up that is so important for a lot of the, of the people on the call is to keep in mind that we are part of a community, right? Those, those communities that we all manage are part of the community that they're in. And not only are we trying to be a positive influence on the surrounding community, we're also trying to attract residents. So when we get the reputation that our property helps you and helps you grow and helps you further your own personal life skills, it, it can become even a leasing advantage. Um, Andrea, I know you see a lot of different clients from where you sit uh, on the on reporting side. What are some of the things you're seeing? So I would, I would absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, really, pre-pandemic, I think a lot of companies are doing social aspects. Um, we saw a lot of, I don't want to use the word disjointed, but a lot of leaving it up to the community or the, the, the building itself to kind of come up with social things for their, their tenants. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, pieces, piecemeal things that we would pull together, um, I would say pre-pandemic. I think with the pandemic, um, that has started to, to shift and we've started to see a more cohesive outlook on social and kind of taking the things that really work well um, and, and applying them across the entire portfolio as opposed to just leaving it to, to that property manager, property manager or even, you know, city you know whatever whatever that smaller smaller portion is and really starting to to take the best of of each of those pieces and applying it across the entire portfolio um which then in turn to to azalea's point makes that tracking piece come a little bit easier um when you're doing it across an entire portfolio as opposed to to piecemeal to you know individual properties yeah, no, that's a great point. You know, so many times it was sort of organic and it kind of happened at the property level. And now we're seeing it more purposeful and more of a strategy develop. Um, and it kind of, I guess, leads me into the, the next question that I wanted to hit on, because oftentimes when we see social initiatives, they, they kind of sometimes they feel like they're at the corporate level or they're at the community level. But we're really starting to see a shift. We're starting to see an expansion. Uh, it seems like that is really focused on engaging the tenants and the residents directly, especially when we're talking about multifamily. Um, kind of to just build on some of the stuff you were saying over at Bridge, um, maybe we'll start with you on, on kind of what's working and what isn't and kind of what are your kind of, your if you looked in the crystal ball, what do you kind of see coming down the road at Bridge to help further that engagement? Sure. So we we have a phrase that we use at Bridge that drives a lot of our efforts, and that's uh, social and economic mobility. So we love our tenants. We love our residents. We want them to stay there forever. 
now there might be residents so that in order for their social and economic mobility to be boosted they they need support they need help and we want to be able to bring the help to them as opposed to simply show them a list of resources and say will you go and pursue them and we are fortunate that we have a long-standing partnership with a great nonprofit uh, called project access and they've grown with us which has also been fascinating for for their own journey and whenever we have uh, committed to having Project Access present at one of our assets, um, it's not just someone comes by for a couple hours a week. They literally have a physical presence there. They have a resource center on the site. And if, again, I go back to the example of our workforce and affordable housing communities, um, we've got a dedicated resource center across every community. In fact, we have the self-imposed requirement that they have to be there. Um, and then we have a self-imposed uh, requirement also about the affordability profile that we're, we're maintaining across uh, our investments in our portfolio. But going back to, to the project access, so the, the key there really is um, they do an assessment of that particular community to determine what are the needs. And typically you've got profile, demographic profiles such that you've got families for the most part, you've got adults, you've got children. So considering programming that is beneficial to, to all, and also continuously checking in with them. So you've got surveys, you've got assessments. Are we doing things that are actually helping people? And if not, then we, we redirect. And we actually had to do that during the pandemic because as you may have guessed, well, we we're very much in an environment where that personal connection really couldn't happen, at least for some length of time. And so we, we redirected with Project Access. The, the dollars and the resources were brought, were converted to Meals on Wheels, were converted to, um, Again, helping people navigate, where do I get financial aid? And there's a, there's said to be a lot of government resources, but I don't know where to begin. Okay, so we did that virtual support. We did wellness checks virtually. So again, a lot of it is just we're, we're moving with the times and we're moving with what is that current need for that resident base. And it's, um yes, there's commonalities across many of our communities, but there's also some communities that, uh, Maybe the age demographic has shifted or, you know, the need for a lot more programs centered on on children and youth need to be there. Because, again, that translates to people that are happy, people that are responsible and they're overall, you know, good tenants for us. Sure. Makes sense. Andrea, what are you uh, kind of seeing? What's working with your clients? Maybe some challenges and kind of what, are, what do you see in the future? I would say, you know, what we're seeing, surveying is key and following up to, to, you know, implementation is great, but implementation, if you just kind of throw it over the fence um, and, and hope for the best is, is not ultimately going to be, you know, helpful. Um, so, so surveying, getting that pulse on the community, um, you know, and, and having, having people who understand, you know, like you said, the demographics of certain communities or knowing that there are going to be some some varying needs, but ultimately, you know, what what programs can remain the same, what what should be slightly tweaked or shifted um, and then keeping your keeping your finger on that pulse. What's working? Where do we need to shift um, and and ultimately kind of being, um, you know, quick on your feet? making sure that you know you can kind of pivot if if something is not working that you thought was going to work or is working differently um being able to take that feedback and understand that that you may need to to shift some things to to ultimately kind of meet those those social needs and i think um the pandemic has really kind of brought that forth to to really show how important following the residents and kind of what their their needs are because again you know pre-pandemic what people needed what people wanted was very different than than pandemic and so being able to make that shift and being able to come up with those additional resources additional programs um to get out there quickly to help is is huge and and we are seeing that people are, are moving in that direction. They're, they're shifting, they're making sure that everything is, you know, we're, we're still here. Um, you know, we're, as much as we want to be out of this, we're, we're still here and dealing with, with the pandemic. And so, um, 
kind of keeping keeping that finger on the pulse to say, you know, do we shift back to what we were doing pre-pandemic? Do we do a hybrid? Do some of those programs and some of the stuff that we brought in with with the pandemic? And um, you know, again, surveys are key to really, you know, or or any other way that you are able to judge that mm -hmm. what is happening um, is is fantastic. Right, the measurement's key. Alex, you, you kind of, uh, Rent Dynamics, you guys kind of said in slightly a different perspective because you're kind of coming from a, from a, a delivery of services angle. I'd, I'd be super interested to hear how, how, how you see it from the vendor with, with people reaching out to you and saying, help us with addressing this. Kind of how how yep. are you seeing it and kind of what are the challenges and what's the future in your mind? To echo just a couple of things that we heard earlier, I think you look at how you can really influence people at scale. And I think that's going to be some of the development and the social responsibility is really saying, what is the impact of what you're doing? And that's one of the things I think is most interesting for us, especially as um, you know we come out of the pandemic, hopefully, and also some of the generational shifts. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about Generation Z and FinTech. And I think there's an uh, you know, a correlation there and just, you know, one of the quotes, and I can link to this after, it says, uh, the dominant decision-making factor is, does the brand reflect my values? And I think we ought to really consider that as, you know, in the housing provider space, uh, they're going to they're gonna make those choices. And I also think that you can make a bigger impact with less effort than you think, you know, kind of in preparation for this, we ran some numbers, I looked around you know, at about 300,000 residents that we've worked with. And just by reporting their rent and utility payments, which were already happening, um, that group of 300,000 people were able to, on average, increase their credit score by 48 points. And when you look at that from an economic mobility standpoint, that's a lot of good that was done um, without a ton of effort and, you know, just a little bit of forethought and uh, commitment to do it from the corporate office. That's and great. Alex, touch on what you said. I mean, those are also those are also new employees, new employees looking for employment. So not only are you not only are you shifting or you know or having a company that they can work at, but you also are providing the housing that they can live at. And you know, I think you are exactly correct. People are making people are making decisions on where they live and where they work based on their values. And and what better way to capture that you know by by continuing to be sustainable and there's kind of an old saying about a rising tide lifts all ships and that's that's kind of in some ways what the social piece does in a way you're you're really trying to raise the entire community by caring and and, and reflecting your values and 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 if you don't think that consumers are <laughs> judging and making decisions uh, based on your values as an organization that they want to buy from, then you're probably sadly mistaken. Um, people want to, especially in times of crisis, people want to turn to those that they can count on. It's just natural. Um, so those communities that care about the residents truly um, as not only a source of revenue, but also uh, value and trying to help, like I said, that rising tide to lift those ships and improve the 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 uh, status for lack of a better word of ever, everyone together right we we all move up together and, and i can tell you from my time on the asset side we live and die by yelp reviews and google reviews and you know that type of stuff so that i, I go back to that community reputation you get that reputation of caring and being a place that people want to be that makes a difference for the community to be honest um I'm gonna shift gears for just a minute. I'm not really sure exactly where to throw this question initially, uh, but it feels like the S can actually impact the E. And I'll back up for just a second there uh, in case anybody's not familiar tracking with where I'm going, but ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. And, and like I said at the beginning, so many times we focus on environmental, but it'd be kind of interesting to see or hear kind of your all's thoughts around how focusing on social can actually improve environmental. And I don't know who to ask first. So whoever, whoever has an idea, I'll let you jump in. I, I can jump in here. Um, I, we are seeing clients who are um, 
who have focused on the E. Um, e tends to be the, I think, the, the one that people tend to focus on first. It's also the one that is most easily measured. Um, but I think the S has a huge piece in how the E plays out. You know, you have you have waste um, and and recycling programs, and really turning that into a social piece, and really getting information out to to tenants about why they should recycle, how they should recycle, what should they recycle. You know, because that is so dependent. You know, you you don't want people who are like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. I'm just gonna hope and recycle it. Um, that's not helpful to anything because then you're ending up with contamination. Things that are, can't be recycled in the wrong place. So really bringing that focus on the E, whether it's waste, reducing your energy usage. You know, I think typically in 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 multifamily, sometimes people shy away from, well, it's the tenant, they control it, it's not us but empowering the tenant with ways to to cut back their energy you know with the pandemic money is a big issue for everybody um nobody wants to be bleeding money and energy that they can save so turning that social piece to focus on some of those environmental initiatives that companies have i think is huge to really push them to see greater impact across their entire portfolio on recycling numbers energy reduction, um, water use reduction, um, and teaching teaching tenants how important it is to to kind of continue those behaviors. Yep, for sure. I often say that the S is synonymous with P and P reflecting people. So everything that has to do with people. And uh, to Andrea's point, uh, I just think about one of the recommendations I was proposing internally is how do we leverage just our ongoing surveys that we do as property managers when we engage with our residents? How do we leverage that point of contact to be more beneficial for both parties, i.e., if we're thinking of introducing solar, if we're thinking of introducing EV chargers to the property, what better way than to survey our own residents and say, would this be beneficial to your life? Are you considering yourself to be in the market for a hybrid vehicle in the next six to 12 months? And then if if we get certain responses, then that also, A, validates that, okay, we're, we're gonna be doing that fin something that financially makes sense on top of the environmental benefits. And also our tenants will, again, be happier. And I know that, for example, apartments.com now has additional fi filters and things like EV chargers and solar. That's part of now when someone's, screening for where their next home is going to be as, as a renter, that could be in there as a consideration. And that might determine where, which properties they gravitate towards in addition to them being, you know, financially in their, uh, in their budget. Uh, but it's also, um, you know, I think it, it can help for certain people that are very much thinking, you know, climate change, like this is, this is actually impacting my life. You know, my parents used to talk about it when I was younger, but now it's, it's the real deal. It's not going away. It's going to impact my ability for my family to do certain things or enjoy certain trips. And, um, you know, it's, it's just fascinating when you kind of connect all of that, if you think of the S, uh, S synonymous with, with the P. Yeah, for sure. Um, when you think of it from a big picture too, you, you hear so often our goal or, 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 you know, climate neutrality or, a climate maybe net zero by 2050 whatever we're not going to get there without the residents if i only do my common areas i'm not going to hit that goal you just don't have enough control over the square footage so engagement becomes super key and i think to really both of your points the the ability to engage talk to socialize educate learn from and and honestly just engage with those residents is the only way that we'll truly get there and really it makes for a, a, a much better oiled machine uh, as we're like helping one another out i'm learning from them they're learning from us the, uh, we're not wish cycling anymore and just throwing it and hoping it lands in the right place it's actually going to the right container um we're you know not replacing the led bulbs with with um incandescent bulbs not replacing the low flow aerators uh that type of stuff i mean that comes from that engagement and that interaction and it really forms what we call community which is kind of what we're all striving for i believe 
any other points? I didn't want to cut you off, Alex, if you had anything. No, I think just the rising tide, good habits lead to, to more good habits. And so if you're really focusing on, on those pieces, and I will tell you, coming back to the apartments.com comment, I renewed my lease at an apartment building because as an electric vehicle owner, I went with the company that shared that same value. So it just was kind of an interesting, you know, that directly impacted me. Andrea, um, I know you you work a lot with reporting frameworks and and, and uh, reporting at the portfolio level. Could you talk a little bit about it? And everyone else, please feel free to join in. But how does the SNG help on, from a reporting standpoint at the portfolio level? How does how does that help? I mean, I would say almost every framework that I can think of right now has some type of SNG component to it where they are asking how how you are looking at at certain governance issues how are you looking at certain social issues how are you engaging your employees how are you engaging your tenants so i mean across the board um i am you know there is i don't want to say an equal focus on the esng but there is a significant focus on sng um probably still E is leading, um, but barely at this point. Um, I think, you know, a lot of these frameworks are very interested in, in the S&G for these reasons that we're talking about. They understand that, you know, we have to bring everybody up and we can't do that unless we have good policies, good plans in place um, and good follow through. I mean, you can have the best plans and policies, but if you don't follow through, um, that's that's a problem. Uh, so, but but yeah, I would say you know everything I can think of: Gresb, CDP, um, SASB. Um, I'm throwing a lot of acronyms out, so so I apologize. Um, but any any framework that I can think of off the top of my head includes some form of of asking about how the company is handling social between, you know, both employees and clients or tenants, um, as well as, as, as that governance piece as well. Right, right. And we have a- um, uh, I was just a, gonna add a couple more to our alphabet soup, if that's okay. <laughs> I know, I was like, I don't know how many to throw out. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I'm gonna just put this one in the chat. Let's see if it goes through. So. Uh, at Bridge for one of our strategies, and it's expanding to others, uh, but the one in particular is our workforce and affordable housing strategy. We've adopted um, the IRIS metrics by Jen. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar, I put the link in the chat box. Jen is the Global Impact Investing Network. And the IRIS metrics are actually expanding, but it's everything from, in our case, we're tracking how many um, communities and how many units are we, um, maintaining preserving that affordability uh, and we you know define what affordability means to us and then when i was talking about all the resource centers so how many of those resource centers have we have we built out over time and we do a report on an annual basis so the metrics are free to adopt you can of course become a gin member if you wish um, but the actual adoption of the metrics are available for anyone who wants to incorporate them into their their reporting the other one that i would say really complements uh what you mentioned andrea you've got unpri so for folks that are interested in becoming a signatory um, and this is across sectors but i know that today's audience is very much real estate multifamily focused and this is this is going to be right up your alley. So if you haven't become a signatory, uh, you can go to unpri.org, you can read about it, but in a nutshell, they want to usually see as a starting point, either a person or a group that's gonna be responsible for ESG and responsible investing at your firm. And they wanna see the initial draft of your responsible investing or ESG policy. So that sort of can get you going there. Um, and I believe you also said um, GRES, and that one's very specific to real estate, um, that is fund specific. So uh, for people that are figuring out, okay, so so where do I start? I really kind of boil it down to where if, the, if you're in the real estate sector, you, you're gonna have to do GRES, whether you, you do it now or you, you sort of push it off for later, but eventually it's gonna come around and you're gonna need to do it. And you can start with one fund. So if you're a firm with multiple funds, just starting with one is a great first step. And the last one I'll mention, and this one's again more general, kind of in the, the UNPRI category, is the UN SDGs, so Sustainable Development Goals. You've got 17 of them. 
you can read about them, you can figure out where you want to incorporate them in any part of the organization. For us, we're doing it in our ESG report, we're doing it in our um, impact report that I mentioned, and then we're also doing it across a couple of our policies, including our responsible supplier policy. So a lot of options out there. And uh, to, to, to just emphasize what may not be obvious, a lot of free resources out there too. So it's just a matter of having a person or a team that kind of sits down and learns about them which is what I've had to do with, with my team and, um, and then just figuring out what makes sense and where you want to start. Oh, oh. I also threw in the chat, uh, our, our Kobe team has an ESG matrix that kind of helps you understand the alphabet soup. So it's kind of like a vocabulary directory, if you will. Uh, so that, that links also in the directory if you're trying to figure out what were all those initials we just threw at you. Uh, so that'll, that'll help with that. Um, let's see. I think one of the things that has always struck me, having been in this space for almost a decade now, is is so often we're really doing a lot of good things that we didn't necessarily tell a good story about. Like it's almost more that there's it's, it, we need to learn to tell our story better uh, of all of our companies. And I think sometimes we falsely think that that we are a uh, we're a blank slate, if you will. Um, I guess to the panel, I would ask, uh, how do you how do you account for the initiatives that were already in place at the places that you work, and and then how do you how do you take those stories and those good things that you're doing and and put them into that purposeful strategy that's that's uh, working you know methodically towards a common goal versus random acts? Does that make sense? Whomever. <laughs> I would say um, there's there's again throwing out more buzzwords. Um, you know there there are materiality assessments. There's companies out there who can help you um, kind of work through through that. And I think really starting to talk to all levels of the organization and and really starting to talk to um, you know the leadership team down to to the property manager and everybody in between and it's you know you don't have to do everybody um, but getting a really good sampling really starts to help you understand what you're doing because I'd agree I would say at this point there there are probably I'll speak in generals, very little companies that are actual blank slates. Um, I think most of this stuff is good business, whether it you tie it to an E, an S, or a G, it's good business and it makes sense for companies. So most likely you are doing way more than you think. Um, and we've worked with plenty of companies that are like, oh, you know, we don't, we don't do anything. And it's like, well, let me talk to your HR. Let me talk to you know these key people because I can almost guarantee you you are doing stuff. It's just teasing that out, and you may not think of it in in that you know ESG tends to be very broad, but it's also you know people tend to think of like um, uh, solar or you know very specific things that kind of fit in those buckets. Um, you know, doing a blood drive that's a social like that definitely falls into social a lot of companies out there have have blood drives or do things like that and it's just talking to the right people and capturing those um that's something that in a materiality assessment um a team can come in and sit down talk to you and talk to your team members and kind of tease that out um to to really focus on what are you doing and chris i absolutely agree with your statement is is it's it's about telling that story and telling that story across the company so that the different the hr director knows what is going on with the rest of the company and having those esg reporting sustainability reports um annual reports that focus on some you know have a chapter on sustainability all of those are a great way to really get out what you are doing in the community, what you are doing across, um, you know, what what new things you are doing for governance um, and, and your environmental numbers where, you know, what what improvements have you made there as well? Um, and really starting to focus on getting everyone in the company on the same page because, um, you know, people are doing this stuff. Um, it's just capturing it and pulling it together. 
I was going to add, so on the on the governance side of things, uh, in some ways, some people think, oh, that's the easiest one. I just put together a team or a committee, ESG, we're good to go. And that's that's a great place to start because to Andrea's point, there, there may be a lot happening, but it's great to have that uh, cohesive group who can then go out and, and really dig into your own organization. And it's surprising how many people I've met in different parts of my own organization that A, don't know each other, so I'm often the connector, or I'll say this part of Bridge is doing this. We've got this really uh, great plan that they've drafted about how they go about, you know, every time we acquire an asset and our energy plan is the following. So then I can say, let's look at the other parts of the organization. Do we have that same plan or something similar? And it's just amazing when people say, oh my gosh, it took someone like you to help us connect and sort of share the resources and the knowledge. The other thing I will say too is just before uh, this meeting, uh, I have launched my company's um, climate change task force. And what was really fascinating is for uh, a lot of individuals, they may say, well, climate change, that's part of ESG, so why isn't it just housed under that governance umbrella? And I, I can I can go on for a very long time as to why it should each grouping needs a dedicated attention and resources. But I'll just say that uh, with just our first meeting, it was it was really fascinating and really eye opening for a lot of us because we leveraged also we have a climate consultant. And that's another thing I'll recommend to you is don't be afraid to reach out. There are so many experts in the field. We've got, you know, here between uh, Gobi, Rent Dynamics and Conservice and and we've we've worked with all of you in some capacity and it's just been great because like Andrea can sit there and say, OK, here's examples of what my other clients are doing and then we can figure out what makes sense for you as potentially a new client. Um, I've worked with Chris, Alex. I know we've worked with you to launch programs. So um, there's just there's so much knowledge out there in the case of an, uh, in our case with our climate consultant, um, you know, I said to them, we we need to start somewhere. So let's just start high level. Let's sort of put the TCFD framework out there for people and they can start to know, well, you've got four pillars, you've got 11 recommendations. Okay, so what do we do with all of this? And so I'm like, we're gonna start with governance. And I said, okay, just the fact that we came together today, this is a new group. We're already checking that sort of, uh, I think it's governance B requirement or, or recommendation. And so it, it's it's been helpful for people to say, OK, this is all tied to something, because guess what? Uh, whether it's investors or other stakeholders, they're they're coming around. They're asking the questions and they may say. And what they appreciate is when you say, here's where we are and we're, we're just starting, but at least we've got governance there. And now we can think about strategy. Now we can think about risk management. We can think about goals and targets, et cetera. Yeah. It's been said that really, honestly, we're saying ESG backwards. It should actually kind of almost be GSE because kind of the government's governance drives the other two and then the engagement drives the environmental. It also kind of reminds me too, just hearing everybody talk so far, there is no single function in any organization, our own included, um, that doesn't have some tie-in to helping reduce the impact. I mean, if I, if I think about conservatives, where I work, the person opening the bill, it is so vitally important that 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 input is correct, that the data that they put in is correct. I mean, every single function is, is critical and builds on one another. And, and to that point, I mean, so just realizing that how these things all connect, half of our job is really to be the orchestrator, make sure that all the pieces know how to work together and, and really most of those places, a lot of those pieces may already be in place. And your employees care. They want to participate. They care about this. And with kind of everybody seeing the great resignation, it, ESG to me is a great way for employee retention. Um, just kind of like I talked about before, if they believe in the mission, they believe in what you're doing, they're going to want to be a part of it and they're going to stick around to help you accomplish it. Yep, for sure. Um, I want to shift gears again just a little bit because um, one of the things that ESG and really specifically S&G influence that I think maybe it doesn't get credit for sometimes is is valuation and and, and it can influence investment decisions, um, particularly uh, with institutional investors who are looking for these type of answers uh, on where they want to, uh, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier about impact investment. 
those impact investments are looking to make sure these things are in, in, in place. So I'd, I'd kind of be interested to hear your all's views on your experiences about how SNG can affect either valuation or influence investment decisions. I'm, I'm happy to jump in and kind of share a little bit of a different perspective. I mean, from kind of like the capital market side, but just on the bottom line, and I'll make sure this gets distributed as well, but I've got a two asset case study that can be shared that will show, you know, a social initiative being rolled out was widely adopted and appreciated by the residents and also was accretive. Like it generated, and again, every portfolio is a little bit different. So you have to evaluate your strategy for each of those. But in the in the cases in the case study, it earned about $10,000 a month for each of these assets in additional income. And through that property sale, generated close to $400,000 on top of that in each of those situations. And I thought that was super interesting. And the other one too, with, with Bridge, that's been fascinating that I've loved to watch is as they've launched the Advantage program, um, which is a program that is all about economic mobility and linking up residents, you know, hoping they'll stay at Bridge for as long as they want and can. Um, but when they're ready to move on to home ownership, they assist them. Well, Bridge actually used some of the funds from that program to give back to their residents and create additional retention. So there's a bunch of creative strategies that you can use and levers to pull to add value. That's good. Yeah, in fact, um, so the Advantage program that you speak to is, is it's a first innings. It's really just launched in November for us. And I know that we've got ambitiously, you know, we want to offer this to all of our multifamily assets um, in the next few months. And even before that, we've white labeled um, what is probably for us been a very successful program. We call it Bridge Credit Plus internally. And with that, uh, while the residents are still with us as renters, they can they can know that their good renter behavior is being reported to the credit bureaus, and that essentially they'll get to reap those benefits. A, it impacts their credit score right away, and B, when they are ready to make that that transition in their life to home ownership, it's also there as a record of who they are and and their financial responsibility. And if I, you know, just think back to to our history, uh, there was there's a legacy asset that we own in, in Southern California, and we purchased it in the mid 90s, and it was a, it was a light tech deal, one of the largest of its kind at that point in time, and when we bought it, uh, it 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 needed a lot of work, and I'm not just talking about you know the physical capex improvement, I'm talking about the social improvements of of this community. Uh, we were looking at about uh, call it 85 to 90 percent turnover happening at this asset. I mean, when you talk about the numbers, the financial impact, I mean, that's huge. Every time you're dealing with a lot of disruption. And uh, we actually, unlike most of our portfolios, this one was unique. We we actually still own it today. But if in our 20, roughly 20 year analysis that we did of this asset, again, under ownership, it has project access. In fact, that's where we first piloted project access. And we found in, um, in that 20 year period, we had turnover come down to in the single digits. Wow. And NOI, as you can imagine, just exponentially also come up. So if you wanna tie things back to, to numbers, that's a, that's a perfect case study for you right there. Um, and another thing that's also really interesting to see is, um, and again, I'm using this sort of project access relationship because it's just, it's been so impactful. I mean, we have many case studies we can point to. We had an asset that we owned uh, in a value add portfolio up until 2016. We sold it and the next owner removed those resources from their, from their community offering, their re resident offering. You know, they continue to own it. We ended up repurchasing the asset for a different portfolio um, approximately four and a half to five years later. Uh, we saw the impact that it had to those residents because of the lack of those resources. So for anyone that was still there, they're like, they remember the good old days, so to speak. Well, fortunately, with us back in the picture as the owner and the operator, we brought Project Access right back in as well. So... Um, and we can already see, like we saw like, wow, this this asset really <laughs> went in a different direction after our ownership, but thankfully it's back in our ownership. And um, it has uh, now a profile that we consider affordable and, and we're of course also preserving that profile. 
Andrea, anything that you want to add? No, I think, I mean, I, I think it's just, you know, especially those stories are just so telling. I mean, you think of of all of the work that has to go in when when somebody moves out um, and all of the, the manpower and all of the resources that go into cleaning and all of the stuff that has to be done before someone else moves in. And if you can stop doing that, you know, you were doing that 90%. If people were moving in, you know, how many times, you know, that cost is just huge. So, so looking at that retention um, and, and keeping people happy and, and liking where they are and like it, you know, giving them the resources so that they know when they're ready to move on, they can, but they are well taken care of where they are is, is, I mean, there's the valuation part of it, but then there's also there's also that just piece where it's like that's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool to be able to empower people um, to to be able to to know when they are ready to purchase a home that they are going to have credit and they are going to have a good credit score to be able to do that. Um, I mean, both of yeah. those things are just awesome. For sure. I've got a couple questions in here from the audience that I want to try to get to. Um, there, there's a question that's asked uh, about um, NAA Units uh, magazine publishing an article that uh, I guess mentioned the term ESG, but then in the article itself, um, it had mentioned how Freddie Mac had poured $877 million into a social affordable bucket. But then later in the same article, referred to the big S as being sustainability and discusses lead standards and efficiency improvements. And, and, and kind of the question is, is there a disconnect between considering social and sustainability as the S and S and G? And, and I'll take the first swing at this and I'll let you guys pipe in too. Um, you know, part of this, and it's also kind of the reason why I threw that roadmap of alphabet soup out there especially for those of us that have been doing sustainability and ESG for a while, we do have a lot of term, uh, acronyms. And sometimes the S that's used in one acronym, ESG is a different S than that's used in sustainability. And it is unfortunate when people mix them in the same article because it can be confusing. Uh, as an industry, uh, I'm the first to admit that we are completely terrible at throwing acronyms at people and not explaining what they are. Um, so part of my job uh, as, a, as a vice president of sustainability is to try to explain things and use common language and use just try to explain things in, in, in more of an explanatory manner instead of throwing a whole bunch of acronyms. But, you know, to that question, I think I don't know that there is a disconnect uh, when we're talking ESG, we're talking about social being that S. When we're talking about sustainability, we tend to be talking about the long-term uh, impact of a project, and those often are E's, they're more environmental, typically. Uh, but it's kind of an evolution. We used to call all this stuff green a long time ago. Um, so I don't know how you guys feel about terminology and acronyms and that stuff, but it kind of feels like we, we throw a lot of acronyms out there. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think as a as a sector, it would be much it would be very helpful to to not do that. Um, I try to be very uh, very consistent and and very um, and think a lot about what I'm trying to say before I say it um, because I you know it's it is so easy to get mixed up um, and and look at it um, and I try to shy away from sustainability, green, um, some of those terms, I try to talk more in, into those E, S, and G kind of buckets um, when I'm, I'm talking through certain things because, you know, there are, there are just so many different acronyms that are out there. It's very easy to get them confused. Um, and, and they do mean very different things. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's, something that we as a as a sector should try to do better with but um but yeah ultimately i think um you know when when i see es and g the s is is social um and and sustainability i tend not to see as as that s 
And and just to 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 add to the fun here, um, there's even been discussions about expanding it. So you've got the E to get you got the S, you got the G, and then there's a lot of talk about adding an R, and the R stands for resiliency or risk management. Uh, I was reading an article recently for someone arguing for adding a T to stand for technology. So who who's to say where it's going to become? But it, obviously it's ESG for now, but um, I know there's a number of players and interests to, to expand it even more. For sure. It's a big bucket. I, I yeah. had a question for Alex specifically. This is a little tactical, but but you were talking earlier about the Advantage program. I, actually, Cecilia, you were also talking about the Advantage program as well. Um, the question, I think maybe you're in the best position to answer this one, though, Alex, because they're asking, what is the minimum unit uh, number uh, in a portfolio or yeah, for account? In a portfolio to implement the advantage program or is there a we we've gone we've really tried to be flexible kind of through our own like esg efforts at red dynamics of taking projects that would maybe would be considered too small uh like we've partnered with uh some confederated native american tribes in northern california and that was a she was like 30. um so really for us that's there's not quite a minimum and we kind of look at two the the big two programs that we really oversee at rent dynamics are rent plus which has been white labeled at bridge is bridge credit plus which is kind of the credit score improvement piece and then tap which is or the advantage program which links people up to housing resources and provides economic and uh it help when they're ready to buy a home um so we kind of look at both of those and and both of those can de be deployed um very very effectively they can be deployed independently and there's there's really we don't have a minimum today and oftentimes we will look at kind of those case by case and say hey is this something that we can do um in a creative way at pro bono i know chris and i uh have strategized and and we've been able to come up with some really creative ways for people to get these programs started um without impacting their budget and in, and many times you know adding you know tangible dollars to the bottom line so you really can get that win-win-win which to me if you can show every side of the coin winning that's the fastest way to improve if someone has to take um you know make a sacrifice in order to do it i think it just slows our progress but i don't think especially in, in social and I, I look at what bridge has done uh, you know bridge has done a masterful job of including these things to to their business benefit i mean this to me is just a net positive um, all around. Um, let's see here. Maybe we'll pitch this one over to Andrea. Um, we're new to S and G. What social metrics should I start with? I would say the very first thing, if you are brand new to 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 the ESG game, um, is is start asking your different your different groups in your company on what's already happening um you know i i mentioned it before but just getting a pulse of where you're sitting um because a lot of stuff is going on that you know the right hand doesn't necessarily know what the left is doing um and so if you can if you can start to tie down those pieces i think that would be the very first thing um and then ultimately it would be you know thinking about what you're doing and then how to track it um, and, and putting some parameters around it to say, okay, great, we have these things in place. How can we track this um, so that you can start coming up with some metrics? Um, because I think metrics are key. Um, you know, if you're if you're gonna do any kind of improvement, you're gonna need to have some kind of metric that you are kind of basing what that improvement is gonna look like. Um, so I would say those are the the two biggest things if you are starting out to, to look at. Um, you know, after that, it's it's starting to look at, you know, what additional things do you want to implement and how do you want to track those? No, I would even maybe add or, or, or kind of say what you're saying in a different way a little bit by saying, what, da what data do you have? In other words, what are you doing and how can you quantify it if you can oh. quantify it? Would that be a survey? Does that be a number? where it seems like if you can have a foundation of data somehow then you can actually assign metrics to it and track it. it's very difficult i know everybody says you can't 
manage what you don't measure, but it's really hard to manage what you don't measure. So <laughs> it is helpful if you know what those data points are that you're going to potentially use or, or at least start exploring them. And even if you can't necessarily this year or, or you know, where ESG it tends to, to be back back facing um, for for 2021, let's say, if, if you can just get an idea of what you're doing, report on that. That's a great starting point. Get it, get people understanding what you're doing. Um, knowing that, okay, you know, this is what we did in 2020. We have some vague numbers. We have some ideas of what we want to do. But then 2022, you can use that time to, to really start quantifying those numbers. So you may not be able to pull those numbers from, from 2021, but you know going forward what you'll what you'll need to track from those programs to get data for 2022. So um, you know, my my advice would be report on what you have. Take what you have, you know, make a list. It's going to be huge. And you may only be able to report on two or three things, and they may not even have like any kind of metric to them, but it's just something you're doing report on it um, and then spend 2022 coming up with those parameters and those metrics and tracking that th that so that your next report for 2022 shows that progression and and you can start to see that journey through your through your reporting yeah a lot of times this, we see people, sorry Chris I, I was gonna say a lot of times we see people afraid to begin the yeah. hardest step is the first step you're yep. not going to do good your first year. That's that's okay because next year you're going to do better. But the exactly. Year, exactly. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking back to some of the the best advice that I got, uh, you know, in the last couple of years from uh, peers that are much further along in their ESG journey. And I said, okay, you you've been in my shoes. What was it like in those first couple of years, those early years, and either what you did that you're happy you did and relieved, or what you wish you'd done earlier? And just to build on what Andrea was saying, um, I mean, reporting is a big part of our world, so that that has to be factored in there. And there's a lot of options. So uh, I would say at minimum, uh, work on your own company's ESG sustainability report, even if the first year is light. You just it's nice to start somewhere. And you can align it to the GRI framework as an example. You can leverage the SDGs. Again, these are all free and available resources that you can adopt and incorporate into your reporting. Um, probably the next thing that was sort of a, a, a huge recommendation for us is, is on the Gresby front. So as long as you're talking real estate, you're talking infrastructure, portfolios, Gresby is going to be part of your world. It's going to be a big part. So even just thinking about your year. So where does Gresby fall in your year? Yes, it is that look back of the prior year. And when you're talking data, they actually like to do two years. So the prior two years comparison. Um, but if like we're sitting right now, it's almost February 2020. You're like, OK, what am I supposed to do in the next 11 months of the year. Well, your Gresby window is going to be key, 2Q of this year. So that, for those of us that have done grads, it's like, okay, we know as soon as one of us says we're doing grads, we're like, oh yeah, okay. They are their heads down. That's what they're focused on. Like, unless it's super urgent, you're not going to get their attention until, you know, July because everything gets submitted June 30th. So, um, so there's a lot of prep work, right, leading up to that. So someone's like, okay, so if I want to do it, where do I even start? Well, guess what? Fortunately, grads, I just put it in the, in the chat, grads actually keeps on file you can see last year's questions so you can literally download the entire set of questions and all the different options and you can start looking at that now now granted the each year it changes slightly but i'm going to give it you know far majority of the questions are consistent year on year at least if you're just looking back one year prior um and then uh the third thing would be um if you haven't already unless your company has like amazing and a dedicated like business intelligent data management team again this is separate from like your it team you're going to need outside experts so you know we've got representatives here uh and you know i'm sure you you each of you could speak to even just more peers in your in your group so the data management piece is 70 percent of your Gresby score so if people are like so what does it all come down to well it does come down a lot of it to the data so if you haven't already you know you've got energy star portfolio manager which is you know again it's run by the epa it's a, it's a, a repository of information things need to live in there ultimately on your assets and some people are like i don't i don't have the time i don't have the resources or the patience to, to manage that well guess what con service 
does that for a lot of people. They do it for us. Um, and Gobi, I know that you guys now are, are a married couple, the companies. <laughs> so um, there's just, I can't emphasize that enough. I, even companies that have been in this journey for a long time, we're talking decades, they still lean on outside experts. It's, it's too much for just even a, a dedicated person or team to do it all. That's really a perfect way to wrap. And I apologize, we said 45 minutes and we ran a full hour, but it's been a really interesting conversation. I really want to thank the panel. You guys have been awesome. I really appreciate the input, the foresight. You guys have really put out some meaningful stuff. I hope everyone takes a moment to really listen to it and think about it because there's some real nuggets in here. So thank you, everyone. We'll be sending out a recording. I uh, hope you have a great uh, rest of your week, what's left of it, and uh, take care in 2022. Thank you. Bye-bye.